Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still at COFES, the Congress on the Future of Engineering Software, for our second annual partnership with them. We are now sitting down with Peter Thorne. Hello. 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 Thank you for coming on to our show. We greatly appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation. We're very excited to talk to you about everything that you're working on. Kimbashi has been around for a really long time. You've been with them as a director for 24 years. That's right. Which is a very long time to be working in engineering software field. Kimbashi is doing industry knowledge for business advantage, helping companies selling and marketing engineering software. We're going to be talking about market data, consulting, training, IoT charter program, engineering software pyramid, all this cool stuff. Before we get there, Peter, let's talk about you. How did you even get interested in engineering software? I was doing science and computer science at university, and the part of that that I enjoyed the most was the 3D graphics uh, in, in computer science. And so it was a kind of natural destination for me. So uh, a very early job out of university um, was real-time software related to driving 3D graphics systems, which, you know, at the time was a big deal. They were expensive boxes and, and so on. Um, and that took me, it, in t I got into contact with application teams, initially in ship design, uh, and then in process plant design, and then later moving on to general purpose drafting systems and 3D uh, modeling systems. I did a lot of that as a developer. Part of that work was on the kind of more on the user side, actually on the chip design uh, 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 projects. Um, and then for me, the natural progression was into kind of project management and marketing and that sort of stuff. And eventually I ended up at Kambashi because I guess I had a head full of what was going on in the engineering software market. And when you're seeing this evolution of these, of computing and engineering software over the span of time leading up to your work with Kambashi, what were some of the big sort of aha moments about personal computing and about the revolution of design software? I think for me, the big milestones were uh, firstly, understanding or trying to understand the difference between geometry as you know the shape of everything and what is a product model what is the data that truly describes the object you're trying to design understand manufacture use and service um, and in, in terms of the industry I, I feel the industry spent too much time stuck on geometry because you know geometry was an interesting hard problem to solve with computers if you go back to the 80s and and early 90s and was relatively slow to be able to see that products were more than just geometry and it was very necessary to handle more than just geometry now things have moved on you know people we've, the industry has got a better grasp of what it has to deal with in order to write useful software and provide useful tools for, for design engineers. Interesting, so this sort of attachment to getting the geometry right was kind of a, it was kind of like a first principle to drive. They wanted to get the, if the right ways of describing what was appearing in geometry on the, two, on, the, on the 2D surface, but in 3D, which is a very complicated process. That's right, and it's a, an absolutely necessary, important part of systems, but it's not the whole story. You know, so when you think about um, new product introduction, actually, it starts with requirements. How do you map requirements into geometry? That's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. In fact, what you have to do is start with requirements, map those into functions, and functions then can make their way into geometry. Mm. And if that's your mindset, you are far more likely to be successful in providing a set of tools which are going to make sense to a design engineer as an end user. Um, so yeah, uh, it, 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 that, it, don't let me try and downplay geometry. It's critically important. Yeah. Um, but, and it took the industry a, a long time to get enough of that right to be able to move on. Um, but you know that I, even 
even now that has been solved I suppose for more than 10 years there are not many systems that are oh, stuck on just geometry now and you would we, we could say that it's solved yeah, well, it's pretty it's, good. It's, ne it's never solved. There's always yeah, yeah. There is, in yeah. this industry. There is always room yeah. for something new, totally, totally. and we can see that here at Cofes. You yes, know, yes. there are startup companies offering new approaches, and you know they're interesting, and some of them are going to be hugely successful. Yes. Now, would you would you then say that when when you when you're taking a a uh, what, what you're attempting to put into a three D space on a 2D surface, these geometries, and you're p putting them inside of some sort of a, of a, you're aiming to make a function, that, 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 that process of finding out how to, how to make that actually occur at its most optimal level, it's, is, that, is that more of a process of the actual software being able to take what you would like for the, for, 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 for the optimizing the function, is that kind of is it a so, is it is it a software by software can different softwares would make it potentially easier to for the function partly um, the way I would it, would it try to explain it is you've got to give the engineer different concepts to work with one of those concepts is geometry but actually, you need to be able to navigate around a much broader set of artifacts, data. You, you know, in, in, they would originally have been documents before uh, uh, computers. Um, you need to be able to navigate around and, and have access to ways of describing, uh, of in, interrogating and understanding first of all requirements and then functions before you get to the specifics, specifics of geometry. And there are different ways of doing that. You know, the systems engineering people often talk about requirements, uh, uh, functions, a logical model, and a physical model. And the geometry part is only in the physical model. You know, one of four steps of the sort of big thinking of how you put uh, a, a product together. So the key thing is giving the engineer the ability to go to any of those places in the description of the of the product and in quite sometimes quite interactive ways you don't know whether they're going to spend you're in the middle of working on some detail of geometry and to take the next step actually you've got to stop and think do I really understand the requirement no I don't I'll go and look you mm. know and and that's where the software needs to be able to follow the train and and and, and Software can now can do this. Click, click, click on the geometry, and you jump up the levels to to see the requirement. Mm. And at that point, you can then say, "Ah, oh, yes, now I can remember what we really should be doing and what how to trade off the constraints around this area mm -hmm. of, of a design." Mm -hmm. Click, 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 back, and you can do the right thing yeah, in, in yeah, the geometry. Yeah. So it's navigation. Um, it's the connected nature of all of these different types of model. And if those things all work together, then you're going to have a happy engineer who feels that this computer model is offering all the right access points to, to make changes, to, to ask questions, to do simulations, and, yeah, and, yeah. and so on. Interesting. So a lot of this is about the engineer having a really strong kind of tool belt to be able to go and poke and prod you to double click into certain areas and see exactly what those requirements were double click back out go to the different area and you know swap things out run simulations this is all kind of what the what the the tool belt can be for for engineers and that's what engineering software can optimally become yes and yeah. now that we've got to that point you know now it's time to take the next step with the, the um, uh, the current situation actually it can be quite quite difficult to understand if you try to draw a diagram of how these things work you find you're drawing diagrams of the various views of the product you know be it the requirements or the functions or the physical um, uh, 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 model and then you end up drawing lots of arrows as to how they connect together because as you can imagine one requirement can give rise to a number of different functions yeah, yeah. and then 
you know, say three or four different functions, and they can be implemented in a number of different ways. You know, there might be a mechanical solution with geometry, there might be an electronic solution. This is will be done by the software in, you know, the control board of the, of, of the product that has, you know, so uh, can, can drive motors and do things, you, you know, to, to enable that function. So, yeah, you end up with a diagram with a lot of uh, arrows on it and, you know, you scratch your head and think, wow, you know, engineers have held this stuff in their heads. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's what they have to do. And in fact, they have to hold multiple versions in their heads yeah, because yeah. at any one time it's a bit like playing chess you know you're thinking of what is the strategy here what is the next step I've got six options on the go which one shall I develop to see if it's the best yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know the great designers can very quickly pick the one that's, that is going to produce the best uh, uh, result just like the good chess players yeah. know that they need to develop play on this side of the board or something like that yeah yeah wow when you make the when you put it into perspective where there's so many different of these arrows connecting um when you make changes how it influences so many other parts and for someone to be able to make the decision on uh for uh, for customers of what is going to be the best um most successful decision that is that is a very very cool way of thinking about the decisions that come from these from from companies about products that they're making now how did the how did the first transition happen to Kambashi for you it was slightly strange actually um, I had known the founder and owner of Kambashi for many years while I was you know doing other other things um, and at one point I was changing jobs just continuing in the sort of mainstream vendor user world of engineering software um, and I was about to be offered a job but I needed a reference so I went to this you know contact colleague friend of mine from for uh, and um, asked for a reference and we got talking and instead of taking the job that I'd been offered I ended up at Kambashi so yeah it was just uh, it was <laughs> a curious a story totally yeah. Not deliberate from my point of view, um, but I had a great conversation and thought, actually, you know, that suits my character of just being interested, nosy, what the Australians would call sticky beak. Sticky you know, beak. Where you just, you, you just want to know about everything that's going on. Yeah. And the world of industry analysts, yeah. consulting, that's that's what you do. You know, you dip in and out of projects with clients, um, sometimes over a period of years. So you can see things through from concept to completion, mm -hmm. um, but you're not involved. All but you're dealing with you know yeah, multiple yeah. clients in, yeah, yeah. in multiple different types of uh, projects. But it was kind of an accident. Yeah, yeah. And then what was this like? 24 years ago compared to maybe 10 years ago compared to now in terms of what industries are you analyzing the most also what types of projects are you guys taking on um if we go back 24 years there was first of all there were still more vendor companies in the market you know there's been a lot of consolidation mm. so um so there were you know just uh, 15 maybe significant players in the market, which meant that end users were asking for advice about who were the strong players in what, what sort of area. So that was an important part. Um, since with the consolidation going on for, from Kambash's point of view, that has seemed to be less of a demand from uh, uh, users now. Um, and there was still, you know, 24 years ago, there were still questions of, does this really work? You know, so there were uh, vendors who really wanted to be able to demonstrate that their stuff worked. Um, and, you know, Kambashi could play a part in that, either in helping, you know, review case studies 
and, and see how a particular set of implementations should be enough to give you know new prospects uh, confidence that you know the, the solution would work in their environment um, and I guess also uh, for Kambashi at least in what for me were the early days of Kambashis, uh, many more of the projects were custom designed projects. So whereas now Kambashi has invested in its own research and development to produce licensable data and materials and, and so on, so just off the shelf content, in those early days it was very much a let's talk to a, to a prospective client talk about the problems, see if we can design, if not a complete answer, at least a project which will help move the client um, towards an answer. So, you know, the, the shorter version of that is to say the transition has been from that kind of custom project environment to much more a kind of licensed data services type of environment. Yeah, yeah, that that seems to be a reoccurring theme of what we've been, as we've been sitting down with people, we've been hearing more and more about um, the services that are now at, at provided on the cloud that uh, engineering software can, can, can engineers can choose to use uh, any cloud computations and that they, that they desire for their projects uh, versus maybe what used to be um, doing a, a, a project as a consulting firm for the, that engineering team. Now the engineering team can maybe go out and find the algorithms and the processes that they need. Um, so then with, with maybe let's go a little bit closer to today then, um, what are some of the most, because the, these, these fields of market data consulting and training, or what, or what, unpack these for us and how Kambashi does what it does in those fields. I, I suppose we ended up with that kind of structure um, because it was all based on our research work. Mm -hmm. So what we found, especially our engineering software vendor clients were asking for was information about industry. So we, as a, trying to satisfy that need, we researched industries. Um, and when we research industries, we get two types of information, both qualitative and quantitative. So it was kind of natural to capture that information. So the quantitative data went in one direction towards our market sizing data sets and the qualitative information went in another direction which was towards the training material that we used for you know, industry training um, and then of course you know it's never a perfect fit for what a client wants so we added professional services to the offer well added that was more a continuation of the traditional business from you know 20 years ago um, but instead of inventing solutions and projects, uh, it, it was more with how to use the assets of the data and the industry content and knowledge sort of inside the training uh, mm -hmm. uh, materials mm -hmm. to solve a particular um, problem. So we ended up with the, with the three lines of business, uh, uh, the market data, where you can license a spreadsheet that tells you about the revenue, engineering software revenues in, in the market. Mm -hmm. um, the training business where you can license material to find out about particular uh, industries, you know, so pharmaceuticals or high tech or machinery. Um, and if just using those off the shelf, that off the shelf content isn't enough, then we'll step in and help you use that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then, when what are what are you seeing as the most common um, market data that people are most interested? The most common training that people are interested in using through you? We did a um, on the training side. It's, at least that's we've got a sort of quantitative, a sort of a quantitative answer there. So um, we had a couple of uh, licensees who, between them, reported ten thousand completions of modules within uh, the, the training uh, content. So this gave us, uh, when they said 10,000, we thought that's wonderful, you know, that's enough. So we're gonna see what is the really popular stuff. Um, and we got 
pretty consistent use over all of the modules. Yeah. And what was, and each time we thought we'd found something, you know, and, and I remember it particularly, um, there were the two clients involved, and one of them, for one of them, there were two training modules that were relatively underused. I thought, great, we found something that we can kind of cross off the list, or doesn't need to be updated too often, or something like that. Um, and then we went and looked at the other client, and lo and behold, those two were right at the top of their list <laughs> of, of usage. So, you know, in terms of training, I suppose we're, we're sort of glad that that is the situation. Mm -hmm because you, you, our industry training is designed for professionals who are trying to work with people in these industries. So they need to learn the language, yeah, yeah. they need to understand the business issues so that they can talk to somebody in that industry and have a yeah, meaningful yeah. conversation. Yes, yes. And you know, if they're a technology vendor they, or a services vendor, they can position their offer in terms that they're yeah, yeah. The person they're speaking to will understand yeah. and I guess what we were seeing was that perhaps there was more a sort of general use of, of the training content yeah. so people yeah. were thinking oh crikey I've got a meeting with a pharmaceutical company this afternoon so I'll spend half an hour this morning in the training content to, yeah. to just make sure I'm up to speed on the words and so on that's a great business development skill set if you're taking a meeting with an industry that you could use a refresher on um, learn some of their in, um, nomenclature that they use please just take the 30 minutes to to learn about the company about the, some of the words that they use that type of stuff because you're gonna have a higher um, success rate with that conversation build more rapport um, relate to their work more this is where these trainings come in, I think, in really great help for building stronger bonds between people. Yeah. Yes, yes, and, and we found our training actually works for two different types of trainee, of learner. So there are, you know, we've seen our training content, the level 100 type content used in the onboarding process where, um, new members of staff are just brought into a company and you know go through the training so that they can work in you know some some sectors but we've also seen it used when experienced people move from one area to another and those experienced people yeah. you know they know absolutely know how to work with customers they've got all of the skills and actually our training we're not trying to teach the skills we're trying to provide the content you know, so as you say, the nomenclature, the business mm -hmm. issues, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And for experienced people, they can use our stuff and very quickly get what they need to, to have those conversations. And then on the market data side, what have been some of the popular? So, um, probably the main differentiator for us and that probably has led to the main use of our data is the detail that we provide for global data by country and by industry. Interesting. So, um, you, you know, uh, we cover, we provide data for um, 56 countries. And within each country, we actually research and model, wait for it, 112 industry sectors. Now, Whoa. You, see, yeah. you, you, you would be quite right to react and say, that's crazy. Yeah, you, yeah. And you are right, nobody needs 112 sectors. Point is, we work with a range of clients and they all think of their vertical industries. They have slightly different definitions. Sure. So they're all completely right that you need, you know, on a scale of seven or ten vertical sectors to organize a corporation. Um, and we have to do 112 so that we can map the industries to our clients' industries and get a good fit uh, uh, to that. So the main use, you know, for the big corporations dealing with uh, many countries, it's in uh, marketing planning, which really means resource allocation, budget allocation, and also target setting. So one of the 
main bits of feedback that we get when we just bump into people, you know, traveling around uh, the world are the sales t teams and the sales managers who say, ah, Kambashi, you're the source of our sales targets, aren't you? And we say, well, no, no, not us. We, we, we just have a, evidently, you know, that, uh, you know, your, your company is a client of ours and they must have used our numbers to help set your sales targets. Um, so yeah, the, it's marketing planning, tar resource allocation, target setting, main use. And I saw one of the images that you were sharing regarding the um, regarding this market data that you end up analyzing and then licensing because there's uh, four, almost four and a half billion people in Asia and the market for engineering software there is growing. GDP is the highest there in the world. And then, so then how do you then end up figuring out out of the, you know, 56 countries, 112 of these subcategories, um, which one then is, you know, that you're really trying to, 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 to either both look at as well as why are other people looking at it? Is it because there's like the most amount of, 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 of interest in Asia is in biotech and you're looking at that, et cetera. Can you explain how this, how these sort of market data um, analyst, analyzing happens and why it's so important? The res our research uses a huge number of different sources. I mean, you know, we started trying to count the sources and kind of gave up when we hit about 800 or 900. So I guess we're talking about, you know, a a few thousand, maybe two or three thousand sources um, of data. And that includes all of the company reports, but it also, all of the provider reports, all the financial reports um, uh, that are available. Which are uh, legally supposed to be correct. Which are legally correct, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. But of course, those reports only cover a percentage of the market. There are all the private companies as yes, well, yes. and there are the, un, the unlisted companies where the data is just different if it's available at all. Yeah. Um, so we go to a huge number of sources, and and we try to maintain, um, we, we try to obtain information from at least three independent sources. Yeah. yeah. So providers is a really important one, yeah. but actually country information yeah. is another one. Yeah. So most countries have a moderate, well, often a reliable national statistics office. Um, they mainly have good company registries so that you can get some sort of filed accounts, you know, from local countries, even for the uh, global players. So there's a country source. And then we look for industry sources as well. And around the world, industry associations provide often quite good survey type information of their members and, you know, indicators of growth and size of market and the use of software and so on. And what we do is triangulate between these different yeah. sources in order to try and home in on what we would regard as the best estimate of the market. And, you know, you can think of that process as a kind of giant game of Sudoku where yeah, yeah. you know it has to add up to a hundred percent because yeah. that's what it must be and whether that's by industry or by country or for a particular provider. Interesting based on their like total GDP that you're looking at a certain percentage of well, the it, industry has to add up. Yeah you know, and, and it's more than that you know it can be um, uh, uh, within a a country sometimes you will find you know surprisingly su sometimes it's surprising countries have done this their national statistics office will have done surveys about the way that money is invested mm -hmm. because the, the mm -hmm. owner governments are interested in this so is the tax man mm -hmm. in, in most mm -hmm. countries and that and they all provide uh, information that way and they can divide up the categories of spend into uh, and and if if we're lucky for a particular country it will include software and sometimes categories of, of software yeah, yeah, as well yeah. and that just gives you another view to compare with the reports by the financial reports the legal reports the legally binding reports from from the uh, 
uh, vendors. This triangulation in Game of Sudoku is very interesting <laughs> to, to be able to figure out what these truths are and be able to share them with other um, entities that are then organizations that are trying to query this data to make it to help it to help make sense of what's happening around the world where they should be investing or looking yeah if you're just seeing software in asia well is that broken down further can we double click and see all of the separate categories of software like uh, yeah. without data the answer is yes yes, uh, yes actually you can double click down to individual vendors that's great and you can double click again to get to product groups from individual vendors. That's crazy, whoa. So, okay, so yeah. we're talking like double click into Asia, double click into software, double click into, into customer relationship management, CRM stuff, then. In yeah. fact, that's out of our scope. We're just engineering software. Yeah, just engineering software. So double click into engineering. CAD, en yeah, into that's engineering right. software, yeah. double click into CAD or PLM, right? You double click into PLM maybe. And then you can see based on on groups, so maybe it's like preventative maintenance, right? And then maybe you double click into that. Yes, yeah, yeah, we tend, like that. by the time you get to the, yes, we do offer an analysis um, by technologies, but they're the, the high level technologies. So CAD, CAE, CAM, you know, digital manufacturing, correct, correct. PLM, yeah, though, yeah. that sort of level. Yeah, yeah. But we also provide the numbers for an individual company. So, you know, sometimes companies use those to to judge market share um, that's because you, we can see you know yeah. each named provider um, and uh, you can see yeah. then how much uh, like PTC or how much um, Autodesk is affecting like North America in yeah. terms of engineering software who owns what percentage of the market shares absolutely yes that is all part of our data and um, uh, 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 we, we routinely send our date, the data that we have about an individual company to that company for comment, um, and um, wow. yeah, some wow, uh, and sometimes they'll reply and say yes, that's very accurate. Or the, the public companies are really quite restricted legally on what they can say to us, um, but I think in all cases where we've made, you know, significant errors in our estimates. Um, a, a company concerned has been able to point us towards a document that has been published mm, mm -hmm. um, that's good. Yeah. that we can then use. Uh, and yeah. you know, that's our relationship in the community is for everyone, um, you, you know, it is useful if our, our estimates are good estimates. Yeah, more data, yeah. absolutely. Very interesting. It's, it's oh, every industry needs a Kambashi to be doing analysis work every industry not just engineering software biotech needs one neuroscience needs in, one in, in my opinion yes because um, I suppose at root of what we are trying to do is to provide a rational basis for decision making correct and we see that rational basis as being the numbers you know understand the numbers understand what the industry is trying to do and from that you can get your resource allocation right and you can make optimum uh, uh, decisions yeah and then it also kind of you know speaks to on a on a geopolitical level there are so many different uh, countries that have certain amounts of investment into something like engineering software well how much is Asia investing into engineering software? How much is the North America? What are some of the maybe like approximates that you can that you can teach us about that that specific question? Because it does it many in many ways seem like um, Asia's um, uh, uh, and engineering is just you know four and a half billion people, so much GDP, so much ability to build, build, create across a lot of land. Is that kind of, is there like a big curve heading up in for there? I, yes, um, and part of it is numbers. So if you look at China and employment numbers, mm -hmm. you know, actually I was just um, looking at uh, the, the number of engineers employed in China is about the same as the total number of people employed in North America. Wow. 
So, so it's know, like four hundred million or something. It, uh, I, you know, I can't. But it's a lot. Exactly, it's yeah. it, it's a lot. Yes. Um, now, <laughs> if you drill down and look at engineering software spend per engineer, or uh, then it's very different. You know, so I think China comes out at you know maybe five hundred dollars per engineer, whereas in other countries it can be two or three thousand dollars. Spend uh, per so, engineer. Yes. What does that mean in terms of software? Like this is revenue received by the engineering software providers. So per, if you just take, oh, per employee. Per per or engineer. Per, per engineer. In yeah. that yeah. by oh, all okay. of them. You can just just add it all up. Just oh, take okay. Total engineering software revenue in China. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Divide by the number of engineers. professional engineers. Got it. Got you it. get a number. Oh, got Do it. Do the same thing in, in the Netherlands. The Netherlands, and, yeah. you get a different number. And a much higher number. A much higher number. Yeah. Which means... Well, the interesting, it, it's the kind of, it, there's an element of development of the economy. What stage are they at? Sure, sure. But in fact, if you look at, in that particular case, um, the average country spend, and then look at, in, at an individual industry. This is where, you know, it, why do we do all this mm -hmm. industry-related mm -hmm. stuff? So take automotive is one that most clients are interested mm -hmm. in, or, or, or maybe all clients are interested mm -hmm. in. Um, actually, the ratio between the spend per engineer in automotive and the average spend per engineer for the country as a whole, that is much less different between China and other countries mm -hmm. you know so the relative intensity of spend in automotive is kind of the same across these countries mm -hmm. and doing that sort of ratio analysis mm -hmm. for the marketing mm -hmm. people you know you, they get all sorts of insights into well what is the state of development in this country how does this country yeah. perceive a particular industry yeah um, and that helps, we believe that that helps our clients develop strategies and decide, you know, how many sales teams, how many support people, should we be forming partnerships to address, uh, you know, opportunities which we're perhaps not covering at the moment. You can pull something relevant to that out of the data. And then, this is this is so important to be able to make these analysis that have these relevant pulls that you can pull from the data. W what about this um, this idea that so many of the the people I saw this in some of your blog posts that most of the, um, the, the it's trades people and, um, and machine operators is where um, that we could potentially serve uh, available markets more. That as if if. Is, is, does that mean that most of the people at the top, these architects and designers, engineers and technicians, and then management supervisors, this sort of these, the lesser areas, does that mean that those lesser areas are, um, that the way that we need to, that we need to disseminate the, the, the CAD and disseminate the, the just engineering designs down to the, tradespeople and machine operators, that that's what we're trying to include. We're trying to have them be included in understanding what's be happening in the smaller amounts of people? To a certain extent, yes. Um, so, so the yes part of that is, you know, that's part of the story of the single source of truth type of thinking of the, mm -hmm. the, the fully digital environment, the digital twins, the connected environment. You know, yes, if that's going to work, you need everyone to have an appropriate access to that information. So they all, everybody is singing from the same songbook, you know, and on, yes. the, on the same page in the songbook. Um, in fact, I think the biggest effect we've seen right now with our clients is when we start talking about employment and looking at some of these numbers, and, and you're right, you know, there are these large numbers larger numbers of technicians and, and machine operators than there are engineers, which is just how, how things work. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible to sort of to trigger a conversation that is all around, well, what do we offer to those people? So our client, a, a software vendor, 
we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at that and saying, oh, I know about what we do with engineers, but hold on, there are these technicians who are working with them. What do we offer to those technicians? And often the answer is, well, it's the same, they need the same software. But for, for, the, for their customers, the real end users, to understand that, maybe um, the vendor has to learn to present the information yeah. about their offer in a different way yes. to a different audience, yeah. and then suddenly, you know, the 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 the, the um, managers of the technicians and the operators realise that they should be spending budget in this area uh, uh, as well. So it's that kind of effect. Often it's just looking at the data and triggering conversations about market strategies, who are we going to address, how should we reach those people. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's where the value comes from, the sort of combination of market size information and employment type information. Yeah, yeah, and the power of storytelling, the power of everyone singing from the same page in the songbook. Yeah, yeah. And then out of the, you know, there's also this, you, you were explaining the difference between um, your qualitative and quantitative market data. Um, give us again the, the, the idea of this regarding your IoT charter program. Because IoT is exploding. The yeah. IoT is absolutely exploding. Uh, we got started in that area, mm, I don't know, five, seven years ago. But we approached it from the kind of engineering tools point of view. So we were looking at the tools used for embedded systems development. Which was what you, you know, and that was exactly what was going on. Companies which had previously been working in mainly mechanical in environments found themselves working with embedded electronics and software in the electronics to build their their products. Um, and you know, as the market developed and the major providers started putting together IoT platform software, the kind of middleware between the connected devices and the applications which are going to drive, control, monitor the, these connected um, uh, devices. We anticipated that, you know, it was really ex just extending our coverage of this tools area, the embedded systems tools, to incorporate um, uh, th this middleware. But to make sure of that, we established the charter program and we invited in the uh, yeah. clients who were potential buyers of this data to talk to us about the research program. And we got some really interesting responses because it turns out that actually our clients were more interested in the drivers of the market that they were addressing of middleware and, and tools what were the drivers going to be and uh, because they were trying to satisfy or they are trying to satisfy a wide range of applications so from connected workers to connected production to connected assets to connected products in in in, in the field connected buildings connected cities you know all of these things can be serviced by this middleware. So what the charter program achieved was to open our eyes, I suppose, to our clients, the vendors of this middleware, as to what they needed in order to be able to plan their business. And that is guiding our research in, in, in this area. And so we're putting much more into understanding those connected application areas yeah, yeah. than simple sizing of that sort of middleware uh, uh, market. So that's new for us and I think it's really good feedback that we've had from our charter program members. This also speaks to the point that you said in your talk too about data being the new oil because the amount of what they have to deal with the mid middleware figuring out the sensor data making it applicable to um, humans that are trying to make decisions in their in the daily lives or even artificial intelligence agent making um, de decisions that the sheer amount of data that is now uh, we're trying to make sense of and make applicable to our lives is just is now 
it's just beyond, I, mean, I think it's every two years that we make more data than we did in the in previous, previous than that. So now in terms of um, the future that you think we're heading to, you know, you have engineering software kind of under a pretty strong like global magnifying lens. You're, you're looking into this area of the world, that area of the world, breaking the engineering software down into different l levels here, seeing how things are ramping up in certain areas, which is really cool. But what is the future that they're all kind of pointing towards? A lot of people see cloud, a lot of people see, um, see generative design. There's all these different sort of futures. Where do you see the trends moving towards? I'm smiling because I've, I've had a conversation in this area where uh, we, I, my conversation partner and I found the easiest way to, to describe that vision was to refer to Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> what do we expect right. to happen in Star Trek? Yeah. You know, yeah. Scotty asks computer. Yeah, yeah, you know, so maybe in the future Scotty will ask Alexa, but do you know, or Siri, or, or yeah. whoever it is. But, but yeah. yeah. Um, and in talking about design and, you know, what do you expect in Star Trek? Of course the computer can simulate any kind of change that Scotty is suggesting yeah. to the machines and the devices, you know, on, on the Enterprise. Um, and I think that is actually a trend which is in place now and is accelerating. Yeah. Uh, and it's simple expectation. You know, um, a, a couple of, maybe five years ago, um, there was a change made in the way that um, a university, I believe it was Boston University, but please don't quote mm -hmm. me on this because it, it, it was a, definitely an East Coast University. Mm -hmm. The way they taught programming to engineering students. So they had been working with, you know, traditional programming languages, so C or even Pascal, you know, to to try and embed the con all of the kind of computer science type concepts. Um, but they moved, and they moved towards the um, MathWorks products. They, they had a specific deal mm -hmm. with that company, and they used MATLAB and Simulink as the basis of their new approach to teach programming to engineering students. Mm -hmm. Now, what's significant about that, the um, Simulink, as you can kind of hear in the name, enables very direct visual simulation mm -hmm. of the code that you are uh, uh, creating. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see what's going on. You know, you move boxes around the screen, you make links. Um, as the way of building uh, a, 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 a model. And what I remember impressed me was the professor involved reported a, I think it was a, it was either a five or six X increase in the number of students who took that class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was the reason for that was because it just was more interactive. interactive. It was, you know, programs were no longer these static things which you had to delve into the data and what look at readouts of variables to see what was going on. You could just see it. Yeah. The same's happening, in my opinion, with engineering design. Designers want and need and appreciate some kind of easily linked simulation to what yeah. they're doing. And if you think about that, that is so close to, you know, well, what Scotty would have done we, without yeah. asking the computer, you know, I'm, I'm going to move, uh, I'm going to strengthen this beam by making this thicker. Mm -hmm. And because in my mind, in Scotty's mind, I know that's going to be able to absorb the side loads mm -hmm. on this, mm -hmm. this particular mechanism mm -hmm. or something like that. Of course, in the more complicated environment, you need the simulation software yeah. to give you that sort of feedback yeah. as to what have the changes that you've made actually delivered. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's going to be a big deal. You know, first of all, the growth of simulation generally in its current mode, which is kind of design it and simulate it and design it and simulate it. It's kind of that loop. 
the advanced systems are more interactive than that, where there's immediate right feedback away, immediate uh, feedback uh, uh, available, and wow. that's the way people like working. Yeah, it fe feels as though that uh, simulation uh, engineering simulation is able to run through the permutations faster than the human creative capability can, and yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's when that's when we get lots of Star Trek in. Yeah, 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 futures and stuff like that. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm, I'm, absolutely, I'm happy. I'm happy that you bring that up. <laughs> and then out of the, the you know, 21st century is here. Exponential technology. All these things are happening. What would be something important for kids and adults to pick up as a primary skill set? Uh, hmm. I, I I suspect. Well skill set. I'm, I'm going to answer a slightly different question because I still think it's the desire to take something apart to see how it works Amen. that is at yeah. the absolute core of whether someone is going to enjoy and feel fulfilled in this industry. You know, from, from almost as a user of the software, as a developer of the software, you know, it's, it's that kind of instinct. Um, that's not really well. Sometimes it's the skill set. I think needed. it is. Um, I think that is very much so. Yeah. What you said is yeah. definitely a skill set. Yeah. Tinkering, taking things apart, putting them back together, understanding how things work instead of them being black box. This is very important. But we have such a limited amount of neural real estate to decide which items we want to dedicate our stimuli to. And it's also true. I, I agree. But yeah. And it's, it's becoming harder to do that. Um, you know, so for example, uh, I was talking to a provider of electrical test equipment, mm -hmm. you know, absolute for electrical type engineers, just the world of take it apart, see how it works. Oh, let's see, you, you know, we can make this better uh, kind of thinking. However, um, they had realized that they were going to be able to make better more functional products at a lower cost if instead of the physical electronics that they had always used in the past, they replaced a lot of that with um, uh, a uh, microcontroller and software to provide the functions. Yeah. Lo and behold, there is no longer any way of just poking into the circuit to read a voltage and look at the, you know, current flow and so on to find out what's going on suddenly you do yeah, need yeah, yeah. new skills to look inside that integrated circuit and find mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. why the software has decided to apply five volts suddenly to this this terminal what, whatever it is mm -hmm. so i think there are certain skills which are not it's still the instinct to take it apart that is the driver for you wanting to build these skills but yes yeah. you do need to learn other things as well to be able to you know take yeah, that sort yeah. of stuff apart yeah Peter, this has been super fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us on the show and teaching us about your work and about Kambashi, about just understanding what is going on in engineering software across the world in its finest granularity. So thank you. Delighted. Thank really you for inviting me. Interesting in conversation. Thank Many you. thanks, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Let us know what you think. Check out the links to Peter's work, to Kambashi as well. Also check out the links to Kofez. And go and build the future. Support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. All of Simulation's links are below. And go and manifest your destiny into the world. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.